and there's a delay too. Hi, I'm Dawn Hawkins from Morality and Media and Porn Harm, and I am here right now with Robert Flores, who um, is on our team, and we're so grateful for that. But uh, he is, he used to work at the Department of Justice and was a prosecutor in the obscenity, child exploitation and obscenity section. And then after that, he was put in charge as an administrator of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, he's been involved for many years in uh, obscenity cases and cases that help protect children, sex trafficking, et cetera. And so we're here to pick his brain about um, the issue of prosecuting obscenity and why we do this, how we do this, what these laws are. Um, a lot of people are always complaining and saying that it's a waste of time and resources to try to, to take this on and have the law um, prosecute pornographers. So let's just start right there. Is it a waste of time? It's not, Dawn. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with you and talking with our audience. Uh, let me start by just making a distinction between obscene material and pornography. Um, for purposes of the work that a lot of people are doing out there, there really is no difference. But with respect to federal prosecution, there is a difference. Obscenity deals with that portion of pornography which is prosecutable, meaning it meets a, a test that the Supreme Court created. And for most people, they recognize it as hardcore material. So that's one, of the, um, that's one of the things that I want the audience to really be aware of, is that uh, it's really very important for them to think about what it is they're talking about. And sometimes you find that the pornographers really take advantage of that and suggest that people have no idea what we're really talking about. But we are. Um, the courts have uh, very clearly defined it. Um, we have had many prosecutions. When I was actively prosecuting cases uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, we won uh, convictions in more than 120 cases. Um, and we had more than $21 million worth of fines and forfeitures. Many of those cases- Wait, how much? More than $21 million in, a, in less than an 18 month period in terms of fines and forfeitures. How much did it cost you to in general, I, I know Le you less than less than two million dollars to run the entire section, all of the prosecutors, all of the support staff, uh, all of the supplies, all of the travel. Uh, so less actually, than two million dollars. The government was kind of making money. Well, what we were doing was making sure that the people who committed crimes didn't profit from it, and they were making so much money that when we for forced them to forfeit their criminal proceeds we ended up taking in a lot of money. So to go back to this, obscene material is, is that material which most people would recognize as hardcore material, and it shows actual sexual acts taking place. Uh, pornography is the bigger definition. It's really the umbrella phrase, and that includes any material of a visual nature or written nature that's um, sexually oriented or, or designed to arouse someone's sexual um, response. So you can have pornography that's not illegal, but obscenity um, is that portion of the material which uh, prosecutors recognize can be uh, prosecuted, you can get uh, a conviction. Uh, we've done it routinely in the United States, and uh, the pornographers claim that uh, no one knows really what it consists of, or even that one famous um, I'd like to refer to it as an infamous statement by Supreme Court Justice that they know it when they see it. Um, the reality is everybody knows really what we're talking about. And the government has never um, launched efforts to get rid of material which were artistic. They've never launched efforts to try to get material, um, statues, pieces of art. All of those things are arguments that the pornographers use to try to uh, convince people that um, somehow we're going to go after art if we're allowed to go after obscene material. So um, that's a distinction. But let me get back to your question, and that is, um, is it a waste of time and money? Uh, it's not for a couple reasons, and I hope that we have some prosecutors watching. And if we don't, uh, I hope that you as citizens will go out and talk with your prosecutors about it, and I'll help you get prepared for that conversation. 
Um, first of all, these are crimes. Uh, the federal government has a number of statutes on the books criminalizing this content. Uh, most states in the United States have statutes criminalizing the content. And so, as prosecutors, we have an obligation to prosecute criminal conduct. And this criminal conduct impacts people's lives. Uh, when I started as a prosecutor in New York City, uh, one of the things that we were taught, quite frankly, is that quality of life matters. Um, it's important not just to prosecute the murders and, and the robberies, uh, not just white collar crime, but crime that's going to make a difference to the, to the average person on the street. Um, we used to have pros problems in New York City where um, you would have open air drug markets. Now some people want to legalize drugs and they want to provide hypodermic needles. Regardless of how you come out on that debate, it's really a very challenging thing to be a single mom living in a place that's perhaps not as nice as other places and then have to take your child to school and have to step over condoms and hypodermic needles and all those kinds of things. And so when all of a sudden she gets up one morning, that's just gone because those people have been arrested, that conduct has stopped. This makes a difference in her life. And I think that's one of the things that prosecutors have to remember. It's really very important to take a moment and think about how can you bring the law to bear in your community in a way that's going to make a difference for the regular person. And I'll talk a little bit more. I'm sure you'll ask me some questions about you know, the harms of pornography and some other reasons. But the other reason that uh, it's not a waste of money is that these crimes are not tied to um, things that um, are minor. So for instance, when we were prosecuting uh, federal obscenity cases, um, we ended up employing the racketeering statute because sometimes organized crime was involved in this activity. Mm. Um, if you are concerned as a citizen about human trafficking, you need to be concerned about pornographers today because many of them are creating a whole new market where you can get made-to-order pornography through webcams. Um, maybe you've been somebody who's received spam advertising one of those services. You have prostitution and escort services that are tied to this. And they provide pornography as a teaser, many times material which is obscene, which is hardcore. You also have a situation where uh, many women and children are exploited by this material. And uh, they may wear a smile on their face while they're being tortured or they're being humiliated um, or even worse is happening to them. But this is not what we aspire to in our communities. And it's a violation of, I think, any community's standards. And that's one of the tests. Um, is this something that is acceptable to a community? Not is it tolerated. Unfortunately, today, we are forced to tolerate a lot of different things because our prosecutors are not uh, perhaps inclined to pursue these kinds of cases or they have other kinds of uh, restrictions that they're working under. But by and large, this is about what do we want to accept? What do we want our community to be like? And so this is important for that reason. The third thing is you can't effectively address a number of other crimes which are very, very important to people. Um, if you're a dad and you have daughters, one of the things that you're concerned about is teen dating violence. We've heard a lot about that. It's in the news all the time, unfortunately. What's one of the things that causes that? Well, I don't have any doubt that it's some of the educational material that's out there. I mean, we believe, that's why we send our children to school, that's why we give them books, that's why we read to them all the time. Um, for those who are uh, committed to their faith, that's the reason why you teach them the Bible or whatever um, uh, holy books that your uh, religion has. And so we expect people to take what they see and what they read and what they uh, spend a lot of time consuming and then act on it. So we have young men who believe that girls like to be hit and hurt when they have sex. They believe that every girl wants to have sex all the time. Today we live in a culture where the pornography is also teaching girls that that's all boys want to do. So we have a sexting epidemic. We have young kids as young as you know seven, eight, nine years old now. Uh, being found to have uh, engaged in sexual activity in their classrooms when the teachers are out doing something else. So 
If we want to address domestic violence, if we want to address prostitution, we want to address teen dating violence and human trafficking, you have to get a handle on one of the major um, contributors to all of these kinds of crimes, because that's where people are being educated about how to do these things um, sh and should they, should they do them. So um, in answer to your question, I think that one of the biggest lies that the pornography industry tells people and even tells prosecutors is this isn't important. Go out and prosecute real crime. And I can't tell you how angry that makes me. Well, going along with that, I think one of the most common um, concerns or comments that we receive is this isn't as important as child pornography. Why are you guys spending your time making a big deal about adult pornography when there's so many child pornographers out there? Is, what, what's your answer to that? Are they related? Is there, what do you think? Well, uh, I think that um, as someone who not only prosecuted a lot of child pornographers and predators uh, during my federal uh, prosecution days and my state prosecution days. One of the things that um, I tell prosecutors is that if you really want to address the child pornography issue, you're going to have to address the adult obscenity issue. Mm -hmm. And the reason is it's related. And this is how it's related. Um, if you have a situation out there where you have so much material, it's just everywhere, you can't escape it. Um, what ends up happening is that you end up with a real difficulty in terms of really trying to find the needle in the haystack. Now, thankfully, child pornography, as large a problem as it has become, is still dwarfed by the number of obscenity violations that exist. And so, if you want to begin to address this, one of the things that you have to do is just clean up the environment. Mm -hmm. If you don't clean up the environment, what happens is that there's more and more of the adult obscene material, and along with that will come all the other kinds of material that follow closely. Some of that will be uh, material which involves adults made to look like children or sold as if it involved young people. Then you might have um, an other uh, sites which actually offer you material that depict children. Now, they're not blatant, but they clearly are sexual. Um, there are pictures that are inappropriately posed or taken uh, secretly um, that show children in their, in their underwear, so, show children um, getting dressed. Um, so you have all of those kinds of materials. If you don't address the base of that triangle, um, if you don't go after adult obscenity, you're not going to send the message to anybody that you're going to go after the more serious things. Now, you might think, well, you know, okay, that makes sense, but how do we actually know that's going to work? Well, in the 19, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, was probably the Justice Department's most aggressive period of prosecution of adult uh, obscenity. And uh, as I told you, we uh, had over 120 convictions. Um, millions and millions of dollars seized from uh, illegal profits. And one of the things that happened was that the industry started policing itself mm -hmm. because they had a very good idea of what, what their community standards were. They live in those communities. Um, my guess is that many pornographers don't let their children look at the pornography that they make. Um, that they are sending them to as good a school as they can because this is really about money. Um, and so you have a situation where all of a sudden um, material featuring very violent themes disappeared off shelves. There were a number of states where pornographers refused to send any material because they knew that it would probably violate any community standard in any part of the state. Mm -hmm. So uh, as soon as you start to clean up the adult obscenity market, um, you start to see impact along the lines because the message has been sent very clearly. The, the government is not going to tolerate this anymore. Communities aren't going to tolerate it. And if they're going to prosecute people and send them to jail and take their profits if they are involved with adult obscenity, you surely are going to get the same result with child pornography. Is this just a law enforcement issue? No, it's not. Um, law enforcement can really help 
but it's not. Well, one of the things that we know is that uh, human trafficking victims um, are often very, very sick. Uh, they don't receive medical care. Um, they are transported into our country uh, under conditions that are just horrible. From time to time, we find uh, these terrible, tragic uh, reports of um, a dozen, two dozen, maybe 30 or 40 illegal immigrants um, who are dead because someone has uh, been afraid of law enforcement and they've abandoned an 18-wheeler in which they have stuffed these people. Mm -hmm. So you have very uh, terrible conditions. Then you also have for, for human trafficking victims that are the object of sexual uh, crimes, you have sexually transmitted diseases. You have a susceptibility to tuberculosis. You've got um, other kinds of communicable diseases. And you've got a, a population then is, as often as they are having sex, they're being forced to have sexual activity with all these people. Um, you have the ability to spread these diseases to a very wide population. And so the husband who comes home from visiting a prostitute um, may bring with him a whole rash of sexually transmitted diseases um, to a wife who's, who's naive, does not, does not recognize what, what's going on, doesn't realize what's just happened. And then all of a sudden she's effect, infected. Um, so you're talking about health care costs. Um, these crimes don't happen uh, in an isolated fashion. Um, we have um, uh, proof now, unfortunately, that we're seeing marriages broken up. Um, so because this is now everywhere on the Internet, mm -hmm. in essence, every home that has an Internet connection has access to the world's largest pornography store. If you're not careful about that, if you don't protect your home and yourselves, then what ends up happening is that you, you have marriages break up. You know, uh, social scientists tell us very clearly one of the quickest ways into poverty is through divorce. Um, you have children growing up without parents. You have uh, young women who are growing up expecting certain kinds of treatment uh, from young men and vice versa. So you have this affecting um, marriages. You have this affecting health. Um, and then you also have a situation where now we, under, we know, uh, we've seen a number of reports where human trafficking victims are forced to have abortions. So you have, again, a situation where um, you have not only the destruction of the life of the woman uh, or the man or the family, but these innocent babies now are being killed uh, in order to facilitate more and more exploitation of these women. So, you know, it's, it's really a horrible kind of situation that's been allowed to grow up. And we have so much material out there that's educating young people um, that I think any prosecutor who's looking to protect his community is, should be looking at um, what they're going to do with respect to uh, obscenity violations. Mm -hmm. um, I think I ask you this kind of question often because I'm always trying to pick your knowledge your brain, but um, so you were, you prosecuted many cases of obscenity while at the U.S. Department of Justice, and also while there you oversaw um, the Internet Crimes Against Children, all the task forces dealing with that. Right. So you've learned a lot. What did you learn? Will you tell me? Sure. Uh, well, let's take the Internet Crimes Against Children task forces. Um, one of the things that we know is that we have so many people who are dabbling now in child pornography, that they're creating a tremendous demand for more and more material. And, you know, one of the things that I thought was, was uh, odd, but I've come to understand that it's not odd anymore, um, is the, the sense that these child pornographers and pedophiles and child molesters, they are desperately looking for validation. Mm -hmm. So they like to share their materials. They're looking to see if there's somebody else out there, whether it's on the internet, uh, whether it's in a community, who will validate them, will say, yeah, I like those pictures. Take a look at mine. Because for, that, for the pedophile, for the molester, what that does is it validates that they're maybe not so odd, they're not so strange, that what they're doing really isn't wrong. I mean, I've been in the room, I've, I have uh, audio tapes from surveillance of uh, child molesters and pedophiles talking about how much they care for children, how much they love them, that their activity isn't about hurting them. And so they've now been so 
become so confused about what they're doing, and they have such a strong desire to believe that what they're doing is not wrong, that they've developed a real need to try and share this information. Well, now you have a lot of people who are accessing that information. They've become bored with adult obscenity, and so child pornography is something else that, that might be out there. Um, for many of them, they don't have uh, strong relationships with people who are their peers, so they don't really relate well to adults, and so they feel that they can relate to a young girl or a young boy because they're so much older, and for them, that's much less threatening. And so you have a situation, quite frankly, where um, you have a tremendous need for um, validation. So they're out there pushing their material. They're putting it up there. They're selling it. They're giving it away. They're sharing it with, with people. They're going to different places. They're creating small networks. And you hear about this all the time. Um, there were a number of major uh, investigations and prosecutions of child pornography rings. These were men who were sharing their material back and forth. And, you know, why do they do that? Why do they risk being detected and getting arrested and going to jail? Well, they do that because there's a tremendous need for them to feel like what they're doing is not wrong when they know, in fact, that it's a clear violation of the law and that it's hurting these children. Another reason, um, and something else that we learned, was that pornography is almost always present at a crime scene where a child has been molested by a pedophile, almost always. Yeah. And the reason for that is it's a great material to use to groom that child and to get them ready for that abuse and to lower their inhibitions. So it's used by people who are engaging in incest. It's used by strangers who end up in a relationship online and they send that child pornography and they ask them, you know, have you ever taken a picture like this? Would you be willing to take a picture like this if I send you one of my pictures? And, you know, you've got children who are very curious, naturally. They're very curious about how their body works, especially as they go through um, adolescence. And so all of a sudden now you have this medium. Just like we're sitting here today, we're talking to a whole audience of people. So you could have a child here who's been convinced to take off their clothes, engage in activity. Uh, why? They might get presents mailed to them. They might have somebody send them money through, pen, uh, you know, through PayPal or some other online service that allows people to exchange money and, and to, and to uh, make money from this. Um, so you have a situation where we know that adult pornography, not just obscene material, but even softcore material, is used to groom children. And um, one of the things that um, is really important to understand is it's not just about the young child. In some cases, the young child has a little bit of protection in that they may be shocked enough by a picture to go tell their mother or their father. But for teenagers, I mean, teenagers think that they know everything. Um, teenagers are desperate to appear a little bit older, um, you know, Anyone who knows a 13 or 14 year old teenage girl has heard the jokes. Well, she's 13 or 14 going on 20. And so, you know, the makeup and the behavior. And so all of a sudden, you know, they have an opportunity to engage or to be thought maybe a little bit more cool or engage in activity that they've seen on the internet. And so it really lowers their inhibition um, to engage in sexual activity, to uh, exchange sexual material with people. And so, Right now, I think for, for most parents looking at this, we really do need to clean up the internet. And the way you do that is by going after the companies who are polluting the internet. And um, you know, this is something that is doable. Don't let anyone tell you, uh, certainly no prosecutors should tell you that this is just too big a problem. We can't deal with it. Well, are they dealing with it right now? They're not. Um, very few local prosecutors and are dealing with it. Uh, the federal government has all but abandoned uh, any effort to prosecute adult obscenity. And it's unfortunate. Um, something that prosecutors should be aware of is that even though there's a tremendous amount of material on the internet, much of that material comes from a limited number of sources. And if a prosecutor were to say, 
well, this is just too big. We can't go after it. Well, then there's no reason to pursue drugs anymore. Drugs are everywhere. Um, let's just give up. Uh, the FBI and local law enforcement, they've been battling bank robbers um, all the way back to the 20s and 30s. Let's just give that up. Bank robberies keep happening. Let's just treat it as something that the insurance companies will deal with. Most bank robberies um, don't involve a gun, and the person who escapes from a bank robbery um, ends up getting only a few hundred dollars. Um, but why do we do that? Well, we say, well, because our, our financial system is too important for us just to turn it over to the bad guys. And if we were to tell them all of a sudden, hey, we're just not going to do this anymore, do you think law the criminals would simply stop with just small bank robberies? No. They would go to bigger and bigger and bigger things because they want more and more money. Well, it's the same thing with the pornography industry. By telling them, basically, as this administration has done, we're just not going to pursue this. It's open season. They can do and go anywhere they want. They can continue to push the envelope with very little fear. And um, the truth be told, many of the largest pornography producing companies are under tremendous financial pressure mm -hmm. because there's so much of this material that's out there that's been copied from their sites and posted other places, material that individuals are posting of themselves and their uh, people that they know. And so selling this material now has become a real challenge. So it's selling illegal material. It's selling illegal material has become a real challenge. So these companies, um, the one thing that they don't want to have as additional pressure is someone holding them accountable. And if they're violating the law, proceeding against that. You know, we're not talking about taking advantage of them. We're not talking about vindictive prosecutions or trying to, to do anything other than simply saying, we've taken a look at the material. We're confident that it violates the community standards. We don't see any serious value in the material. And it clearly was pandered uh, and sold as material for specifically a sexual purpose. And I think prosecutors ought to look at that. I think most communities are, are not dead. Uh, this is not what they want. And now we have a tool that we've never had before, uh, which is science. Mm -hmm. You know, when I started doing these prosecutions um, in the late 80s, um, we made these, uh, we did these prosecutions and we defended them on the basis that this was the law, that this material was harmful. Um, and we took a, a public morality, a public health position on them. Today, we not only have those arguments, which I think are more than sufficient to make the case, but today we actually have neuroscience telling us this material is extremely harmful. It's different from every other form of speech because of how it impacts the human body and the human brain. Mm -hmm. And for children who are not even sexually developed but are seeing these images, when they go through puberty, when they go through their, their sexual development, and they're getting a steady stream of this material educating them about what they think is normal activity but is in fact deviant material, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be surprised, quite frankly, if we're starting to grow entire generations of young people who are going to be engaging in all manner of deviant and very harmful sexual activity which, you know, uh, will contribute to cervical cancer rates continuing to go up for young women. Will, um, one of the things that most people are not aware of is that um, penile cancers are skyrocketing among young people. Um, these are diseases and situations which we could never have encountered, uh, we, which never encountered before. We couldn't even conceive of this kind of a situation. But because the internet has become really Instead of, you know, the World Wide Web, WWW, it's, it's accurately called now, I think, you know, the Wild Wild West or the Wild Wild Web, um, you now have a situation where there just really is a sense that there are no rules. Mm -hmm. And the rules that apply in the real world apply to the Internet. And the Supreme Court of the United States, the final arbiter as to whether or not these kinds of cases can be brought, has said repeatedly, the same rules that apply in the real world apply on the internet. Um, and uh, I would love to see prosecutors pick up 
uh, the mantle and continue to do this because it makes a difference to men and women and children and families in middle America who are not going to encounter uh, a lot of white collar crime or they're not going to be impacted necessarily by drug crime or they're not going to be impacted by um, some type of international mm -hmm. treaty violation, all of which prosecutors love to, to do and are engaged in. This is a quality of life crime. This is something that will make a difference mm -hmm. for people and will um, remind people that this is wrong. Um, my son, um, when we were talking about this now years ago, said to me, well, if it's illegal, why is there so much of this stuff available on the Internet? And it's terrible that a child will ask a parent that question because what it means is that the parent's generation has failed to do its job. And, you know, that's what we elect prosecutors to do. That's what we expect the president will demand from his chief prosecutor, the attorney general, and unfortunately we haven't seen that. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we are almost out of time, so I just want to say to any of you who are watching, if you log into chat, you can type in questions and we'll try to answer them. Um, but I, I have a question. Um, since the federal government is not enforcing the law, since the U.S. Department of Justice now disbanded the task force and said that essentially they don't care about this issue, can the state handle these cases or is this really a federal government no, I, I think that the states could do uh, a lot. Um, certainly, attorneys general, attorney general's offices have been very uh, aggressive in looking at all sorts of crime that they never looked at before. I mean, they're pursuing complex financial crime, uh, Ponzi schemes, health care violations, Medicare, Medicaid fra uh, fraud. I mean, so uh, attorneys general's offices can certainly play a role. But the local prosecutor can play a role, too, because um, there's a tremendous amount of information that's available uh, to help prosecutors. And there are experienced prosecutors who have done these cases in the past who are more than uh, willing to come in as a consultant to work with a local prosecutor on these kinds of cases. And state law is, is very clear as well. With the exception of, of uh, two states, um, every other state has a good obscenity statute on the books. And uh, the task forces, the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Forces, um, they also have access to a lot of good information and support. So it may be that one of the things that a prosecutor wants to do is uh, when he finds a child pornography case that they're going to prosecute, and many of them do, if, that, uh, if they come across adult obscenity, they should include those charges as well, not against just the abuser who is using the material, but against the company that produced it. Because now you have this mm -hmm. argument, which is, Ladies and gentlemen, let me show you how this material is used in real life. And then ask yourself, does this have some other serious use, some other serious value? It doesn't. And in fact, the pedophile knows that. Mm -hmm. The child molester knows that. Mm -hmm. They know exactly what this material does and can be used for. And so uh, I would certainly encourage state and local prosecutors to think about how they can include obscenity charges against the makers and distributors of this material not just an additional charge against the molester, because that will be a lesser charge against the molester than the actual sexual abuse of that child, which is typically a, um, a first-degree rape or sodomy. Okay. Um, Chelsea, we'll get to your question in a second, but uh, since we were just talking about this, we'll answer Vana's right now. She asks, uh, can only a federal prosecutor reach a nationwide Internet porn distributor, and how does the state regulate Internet porn? Um, no, a state prosecutor can prosecute any pornography on the Internet that's coming in and available in his community. Um, the pornographers don't like that, and they continue to make noise about why that shouldn't happen, and they've continued to try to defend on that, but the Supreme Court has been very, very clear that community standards are what um, is used to judge. And today, you know, it's kind of laughable. Um, everyone's talking about uh, the internet and how much control we have and the advanced technology that we have and, and how uh, granular, how, how specific we can get with our internet uh, so that we know exactly who we're talking to. We have companies who are going to make billions of dollars making sure that they know who we are and when we enter a store and when we move away. So today, 
the whole idea of you have no idea who you're dealing with and where your material is going is laughable. I mean, if you take a look at um, major programming, sports programming, um, NFL football is available in London. Uh, that's not available to us on the Internet in certain states because of blackout rules. So um, the technology is now very, very advanced, and they can block out a lot of content. They can make it very, very difficult for you to get it. Um, they can deal only with an adult. Um, so, you know, we, we have now evolved to a place where um, a state prosecutor can prosecute a company from California or from France or from any other country in the world who is committing a crime in their community. Um, we do it in financial fraud cases. We do it in um, many other situations. So this is no different than that. Um, and again, it's part of what the pornography industry has continued to push, that it's unfair, um, as if somehow the loss of their material is going to impact um, our, our world in a negative way. Um, okay, Chelsea asks, and I think I want to answer first. Sure. Okay. She asks, what can we do to put pressure on the federal government to prosecute these cases? Um, so there's a lot that you can do. We have launched, I think it's been two years now since we started the war on illegal pornography, the goal of which is to get the federal government to prosecute obscenity. Um, we have a website, warnillegalpornography.com. We always have action items that you can do to help, and many of you have helped, and have gotten, because of that, we've gotten pretty far. Um, right now, we're really working with Congress, uh, trying to gather support there so that we have their aid in pressuring the U.S. Department of Justice to basically do its job and enforce the laws. Um, thousands of you just recently signed a letter that we sent to Congress to key, um, to key congressmen asking for a hearing on the issue of pornography. If we could get a hearing, an official hearing in Congress to talk about the issues and the harms of pornography and what can be done, that would put a lot of pressure on the Justice Department to enforce the laws. So there's always things like that you can do. You can talk to your local representatives. Really the best thing is go to warinillegalpornography.com and sign up for the email so that way we can keep you updated about what types of things you can do on a daily basis. Um, anything to add to it? Well, I would just say that in every federal district, there is a chief federal prosecutor. And uh, I would make an appointment to come in and talk with that person or a member of his staff and um, in share your experience, share your desire that they prosecute these cases. Um, you know, prosecutors have a responsibility. And sometimes what they will say when they're pressed is, I've never had anyone come into my office asking me to prosecute obscenity cases. I've had plenty of people come in and say, we want you to do something about child sexual abuse. We want you to do something about Medicare fraud. We want you to do something about uh, other federal violations. But no one's come to my office. I, I don't think it's a problem in our district. So one of the things that you can do is just make an appointment. Visit with your local officials. Ask them to help you protect your family and your community from the impact of uh, material which is harmful to people and uh, write a letter of thanks if they do that and if they don't do that then write them a letter and and ask them to explain why they're not doing that um, sometimes all it takes is having a member of the community um, sit down across the table from the chief federal prosecutor and say look this is important to me I'm a businessman in this community I shop I work I go to school, I've got children who are doing this. Um, you know, I want something done about this because every time I get on the computer, this is a problem. Or I have a child who has become addicted, 13, 14 years old, and already they're gonna have to deal with this for the rest of their life. Um, or, you know, I don't, I've got daughters. I don't want them raped. I don't want them abused. I don't want them pushed and pressured to engage in the sexual activity that is you know, the majority of what's online. Um, I want somebody to do this, and I want somebody to say very clearly, this is the standard in our community. And unfortunately, given the way our obscenity, um, the law has developed over the years, it's necessary for a jury to conclude that material is obscene before you can get rid of it. 
So without those prosecutions, nothing will happen. Um, so this is one of those places where your local prosecutor and your federal prosecutor are key players. So go call them this afternoon, make an appointment. For the federal prosecutors, you can get their name and their telephone number in the blue pages or just uh, type in U.S. Attorney and the city that you're in. You'll get their information and just make an appointment to meet with them. Don't just make a phone call. Make an appointment. Go visit with them. Let them see a face connected to this issue um, so that they uh, are aware of just how serious you're taking it. Yeah, that's a good point. We're just normal people. We're trying to make a difference, and we other people can do that too. That's right. Um, okay, I think we have to end now. There's a lot of work to do today, and so I just want to say thank you all for tuning in, and thank you, Bob, for letting us learn from you. And um, any of you who are watching, if you want more information specifically about um, the enforcement of obscenity and hardcore pornography, then go to warrantonillegalpornography.com. Feel free to contact us. We'll try to help you. If you want to practice talking with us before you go meet with your prosecutor, that'd be great. Um, you can email us at grassroots at pornharms.com. Okay, thank you.